Thanks to everyone who has joined. We will be starting shortly. Hello everyone, a very warm welcome from the Australian National University here in Canberra. I hope that you and your loved ones are keeping safe and healthy. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Nanawal and Nambri people who are the traditional owners of the land where ANU is located and where we are broadcasting to you today from. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Many of you are joining from various parts of Australia, India and the globe, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all those lands and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I am Devishi, a medical student and a volunteer for the ANU COVID-19 PA support program. In joining me are my colleagues, Dr. Deepti Talaulika, who is a clinical hematologist and the program lead for the ANU COVID-19 peer support program, and Dr. Pinky Dharm Shaktu, who is the Associate Medical Director at Merck Healthcare and also a volunteer with this program. Now, before I begin to introduce our speakers and panelists for today, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. All attendees have their videos and microphones switched off. This helps us keep the sound quality clear and reduce any interference during the webinar. I encourage all the attendees to ask questions and to do so, please use the Q&A button that you can see towards the bottom of your screen. If you do not wish to be identified, you can submit your questions anonymously and you can submit your questions at any time. The panelists and the speaker will go through them at the end of the talk. With the polls, there will be some questions that will pop up on your screen during the talk please do select your preferred responses to those questions. We can assure you that all responses will be anonymous. And lastly, if you have any technical issues or any questions after the talk, please email international.health at anu.edu.au and we will try to assist you as best as we can. Please note that this forum is being recorded. So today's webinar will be delivered by Dr. Nicola Schembri on chest imaging findings in COVID-19 pneumonitis, where she will be sharing her first-hand experience of diagnosing numerous UK-based COVID-19 pneumonitis cases on chest CT, and she will discuss the typical acute image findings, early and long-term chest complications of COVID-19 infection. This will be followed by a panel discussion with our panelists, whom I will shortly introduce, uh, and they will discuss more practical issues and also answer any questions from the audience. Dr. Nicola is currently on a fixed term clinical placement as a specialist radiologist in Southland Hospital in Verkagel in New Zealand. Uh, and she has held a leading role in medical education, both in medical student and radiology specialist registrar training programs in the UK and Australia. I would also like to welcome our esteemed panelists, who are Dr. Raju Kalidindi, who is the CEO and medical director of 
Apollo Radiology International in India. And we also have Dr. Thiru Sudarshan, who is a consultant radiologist based at Nine Bells Hospital and Medical School in Dundee, Scotland. It is our great pleasure to have you all here. With this, let's begin the webinar itself. Just give me a second and I will share the screen with the slides. And over to you, Dr. Nicola. Thank you. Thanks you for that introduction and thanks everyone for joining us um, this evening and daytime, wherever you are in the world. So this is just going to be my um, first-hand experience of um, COVID imaging with regards to the chest complications. We know that through various webinars that have been discussed already, um, COVID does affect other parts of the body, but for the scope of this session, we're looking at um, the, the chest findings. So yeah, we can move on to the next slide, thanks. So the background to all this is that um, at the start of the pandemic last year, there was this questionable role of imaging as to whether it is just going to be contributing to the diagnostic findings of what COVID looks like, um, but actually took on a more um, central role in the diagnosis of COVID when resources started lacking. So for example, in China where volumes were really quite large, um, there was a situation where um, the resources weren't um, coping with testing. So it was found to be a, quite a useful resource to use um, CT scan as being um, quite a sensitive diagnostic tool in diagnosing the condition. However, across the rest of the world, there were some reservations as to whether imaging should be used as a first line diagnostic tool, where testing um, with um, COVID PCR was actually still yet um, available um, in other countries. Now in April, as the conditions started spreading across the world, we needed to have a form of consensus across um, different um, imaging departments in different parts of the world. And Fleischner Society, which is based in America, came up with a cons consensus statement um, based on a scoring system on what we should be reporting and how we should be reporting these findings with a view to um, giving an idea to clinicians on the degree of severity of illness, but also giving us um, a form of guidelines as to who should be imaged and not. Should we be imaging the whole population with symptoms of COVID or should we simply be imaging patients who are um, symptomatically unwell that are requiring hospital admission. With my resources being provided to the UK um, market, um, there was the British um, Thoracic Soci uh, Society of um, Thoracic Imaging, which had its own um, guidelines um, put in place. The idea was on the same lines as that of the Fleischner um, Society, but the scoring system was slightly different. And we'll discuss that in the next few slides when it comes to the scoring of disease severity. Following on from that then, we started seeing as the pandemic spread and the condition um, started becoming more debilitating, we were seeing the um, outcomes of the condition with its complications. So a new population of diseases was um, emerging with regards to the long-term complications of these respiratory illnesses, which we will be discussing that. So the British um, society then came up with its own um, follow-up guidelines on how we should be following up um, these respiratory ailed patients. Move on to the next slide, thanks. So the role of imaging was actually changing here. So from the questions as to whether this should be a diagnostic tool, it then moved on to being um, for follow-up. But we're also seeing that there were lots of challenges involved if we were to use this um, as a diagnostic tool to see if patients indeed were suffering from COVID or not. We were seeing in our department, and this is something that I won't be delving too much because it's very much a topic in its own right, is to devise protocols on how we were actually bringing these patients to the department to minimize the risk of the staff who are actually taking those pictures and handling those patients from 
the wards and from the emergency department to the scanning um, department and taking them back to the wards with the risk of spreading infection to our staff. So we needed to devise pathways um, to reduce that risk. The cleansing um, of the scanner was also significant impact on the throughput of patients coming to the department. So it takes a minimum of 30 minutes between patients from one scan to the other. And in 30 minutes on a normal daytime, we can fit in at least about um, six or eight scans, depending what type of scan um, is being done, you know, with the idea that a, a CT brain it can be done in about 30 seconds um, to a chest abdo pelvis being done in about five, six minutes. You can imagine, you can calculate the maths on how many scans we are clearly not doing in that 30 minutes of cleansing. So the logistics there um, had to be taken into consideration. The prioritization was also being focused on patients who were in the hospital and also then patients who were what regard, regard as elective work, you know, so people coming in for routine work or oncology follow up had to be delayed and postponed to an unforeseeable return to norm whenever norm was ever going to be knowing full well that we're going to have a huge backlog and the backlog is in the millions at the moment in the UK, which I can quote. Um, and we saw that coming and we're trying to cope with that now, um, which is really difficult. The other worrying thing, if we were going to be considering um, imaging as a diagnostic tool in the early stage, we full know now that, well, and even at the time, we were seeing that um, imaging findings were not emerging until, at least until about day six of having had the infection. So it wasn't actually a very reliable tool at the very, very early stage because we were getting this false reassurance that patients were actually negative when they were still positive all the way. It's just imaging wasn't depicting that um, at that stage. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So then the consensus had to narrow all this down, basically, that the role of imaging was very much in the context of um, making a decision, a management decision on to what, um, which patients we were going to triage, depending on the severity of illness. And really then what actually emerged um, really quite importantly is to, to deal with the complications. And we will be talking about the complications in the next few slides. The other thing is that, as you many of you know, um, who are listening to this, the symptoms of COVID are very nonspecific. You know, there's very much cough and shortness of breath. And you can get cough and shortness of breath with several other illnesses that not, are not even necessarily an infection. And the role of imaging um, comes into play to exclude um, those conditions or separate them out um, if we're thinking of COVID-19 um, infection because the management is going to be completely different. So move on to the next slide, please, thanks. So I'll present you with the first poll question here. And for those of you in the audience who um, can look at these, so there are a few things that we can see on a chest CT. And there's a whole list out there that um, we could choose from. So which one of the list do you think is the most classic um, for COVID-19 infection? I'm just saying most classic. Okay. So yes, so um, it's it wasn't meant to be a trick question. Obviously, here um, it's just really to just get going with the um, findings. Um, so yes, yeah, so we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Okay. 
next slide. Thanks. Action. So yeah, so in the acute situation, um, this is the commonest um, classic presentation that we see on CT. So this is a coronal view um, of the chest, and you can see this you know, peripheral haze um, on the side. So um, COVID-19 infection tends to affect the peripheral of the lungs, tends to spare the central areas, unlike some other infections where um, the lung is affected quite diffusely. You tend to get more of a ground glass predominance rather than dense consolidation, unlike some of the bacterial lobar pneumonias, for example. There tends to be a lower low predominance in the early stage, but as disease progresses, as you can see in this particular image, um, a, the infection really starts to involve even the mid and upper zones. So it kind of ascends in that way. And then actually you end up um, getting more involvement of both lungs. It is quite common to have bilateral involvement with multiple areas. It's very rarely that we were seeing just the one lesion. In fact, the severity scoring had started by including just one area of ground glass, but I must admit, I don't think I ever saw a single case where it was just the one um, case. Now, there are some um, findings in the images that seem to be really quite sensitive towards um, COVID. They're still not specific, and we'll discuss this in the next few slides, but Areas that are described as crazy paving, where you get inter and intralobular septa thickening, um, is something that was very commonly seen during in the more severe cases. And then as severity progresses, uh, there tends to be consolidation that develops around the pulmonary um, lobule. So they get this perilobular um, consolidation, which can also be referred to a reverse halo sign because you get this kind of halo um, around the, the, the lobule. And then as, as, as the disease progresses and becomes more of a, like something similar to acute lung injury, um, in the context of very severe um, uh, pulmonary injuries due to any other cause, be it to, due to trauma, be it um, other shock syndromes. Um, peripheral consolidation then gets um, more evident in addition to the ground glass, where then we can see air bronchograms. But when that happens as well, you start thinking, and especially if the patient is taking a different trajectory, you start thinking, is the patient now having a secondary um, um, opportun um, infection on top of this? So quite commonly, patients were getting bacterial infections on top of um, their viral infections. So sometimes when that happens, it's actually quite difficult to separate out the two. So we can move on to the next slide, thank you. So these are some depicted um, examples of what I was referring to. So with uh, crazy paving, as you can see in the left-hand side image, you can see this very fine intricate of lines um, that are within the pulmonary lobules. You get intralobular septa thickening um, in addition to um, the interlobular septa thickening. And this is really quite a severe case. So these are examples of known positive, um, PCR positive patients um, for COVID infection. And as you can see then in the right-hand side image um, with perilobular consolidation, you get areas of more focal um, consolidation as you can see um, in the, um, uh, particularly there in the mid zone um, of your left lower lobe where you get this area of spared lung, which is normal lung, and then this halo of consolidation um, around it. Thanks, can move on to the next slide, thank you. So the problem, like I was saying earlier, is that you know, patients can present with cough and shortness of breath um, for you know, several reasons. And the role of imaging here is really to help us separate these out. So going back to the initial poll question where I asked, you know, what are the classic, you know, what, which one of these is classic for COVID-19 infection? It is actually quite important to keep those at the back of our mind, because if the image findings do not quite fit in with what we expect um, for um, these findings, then we really ought to be start, starting to ask ourselves, are we dealing with another cause of um, cough and shortness of breath? And obviously, you know, in this pandemic, people are still going to have the common diseases that we see on a day to day basis, you know, like, you know, heart failure with findings of palm edema. Um, so, um, so, for example, 
in the case here in the bottom uh, right hand corner, you can see an example of um, acute palmar edema where you've got a large heart, fair enough, it's, it's an AP projection, so hearts normally tend to look a bit big on an AP projection, but there's a lot of perihilar um, infiltrates there, which is not typical of COVID-19 infection at all. Like I was showing you earlier, the um, changes tend to be more peripheral, whereas in this case, they're more central. And also when you start seeing pleural effusions, you can see a meniscal line there, COVID-19 infection doesn't commonly show, um, doesn't usually get be accompanied with pleural effusions. So if pleural effusions are present in addition to other signs of what we think are classic of COVID-19 infections, start thinking of super added um, conditions. So patients, you know, particularly when we were seeing the first variants, they were very much affecting the elderly population. So in that cohort of patients, you are gonna have underlying cardiac disease and any infection is going to trigger um, a degree of heart failure. So you could have both conditions happening at the same time. So for example, then in the other image on the um, left hand. Dr. Nicola, the, sorry yes. to interrupt. One of our attendees has asked if you could please point out the changes in the image. So if you can see an option which says annotate on the top of your screen. Uh, yeah. Or maybe in the drop down, there might be a drop down. Or the view options. Oh. Yes, yeah. I can, yes. Annotate, yeah. And then that would give you a whole host of options uh, to either oh, draw right. or put a, yeah. So if you can just annotate that, that would be great. And Thank you. A mouse. So I, I clicked on mouse. Do you yeah. see my pointer? Um, not yet. Uh, maybe try draw. Okay, I'll do draw. I'll get the arrow perhaps. Oh yeah, something like that. Um, like that, can you see that? Yes, I can see the arrow, yep. And then green arrow. remove yeah. it, That's and then I'll do. Okay, yes, excellent, sorry, thank you. Great technology, fantastic. Yeah, I just thinking that my cursor was showing, so thanks for that. So sorry, so I'll come back to um, what I was showing. Or, oh no, so let me just get away this. Um, so yeah, so, so in this particular case, so in the in the image on the in the left um, on the left bottom corner, you can see an area here of um, hollowness. So there's a cavity there, and COVID nineteen infection does not cause cavitating lesions. It doesn't tend to form um, abscesses within the lung. So if you see an area of cavitation within the lung, you're going to be suspecting other conditions, um, other bacterial infections, or for example, tuberculosis. So particularly depending on where the ethnicity um, is of where this, this imaging is happening. So it would be nice then following this, um, we'll have discussions with our panelists, um, particularly Raju, who's, who is currently in India, and see if, if there was any um, difficulty in separating these out during the um, peak of the pandemic. And then, for example, in the image in the top um, uh, section here, um, we've got these areas um, of tree and bud opacification. Now, COVID-19 infection doesn't tend to cause areas of tree and bud. So when we see tree and bud, you're going to start thinking of other causes of small airways, um, inflammation and infection. So it kind of takes us away from the notion of COVID-19 infection. And again, could bring in TB in the equation um, if this is um, an endemic um, place where TB is quite prevalent. Um, yeah, so we can move on to the next slide now. um okay do you want me to close that yeah maybe try maybe try clicking on your end because i think you've taken the control now so maybe it's not giving me all right um no i don't have requests remote because i it's still within to me okay, maybe stop the annotate uh close the annotate button. i have i have okay oh dear okay Right. Then what I can do is I'll request remote control and just take take lead then. Okay, maybe try that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How's that? Uh -huh. Okay. 
No, yet won't let me. <laughs> Apologies for the technical hitch, uh, everyone. Just give us a couple of minutes. Oh, we managed that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, excellent. Okay, so I can take control now. Um, yeah, we'll come back here. Okay, so we're presenting with another poll question now before we move on to the next slide. So in the first question, are these imaging findings specific to COVID-19 infection? And then the second one, is the severity and extent um, a good predictor of prognosis? Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, so in fact, no, they aren't specific. And you're all quite right um, about that. You know, the majority of patients, of, I mean, it's not patient, um, people have um, answered to that. And I kind of gave away myself when I was talking about the crazy paving earlier. And yes, yeah, so, and, but this is really important um, to, to stress this point um, that these findings aren't um, specific and to be aware that we are still at an age where uh, it's a situation where um, other conditions are still happening and we will go through the COVID mimickers in the next few slides um, because we, we could be denying patients of a specific treatment if we seem to be thinking it's one and not the other. And then we'll also then discuss the degree of severity with regards to prediction um, of uh, comorbidity. And actually it, it tends to, so imaging tends to be a really good tool um, in the inpatient situation where we can um, triage and see who we, can, who we are going to need to escalate um, treatment for. So um, I can't move on. Devashi, I think, yeah, there you go. So yeah, so these are the, the, the mimickers um, we tend to have. So let's see if I can annotate again without disrupting the session. So as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer there. Um, so with crazy paving, as we saw in the earlier um, image, now that was a, a uh, COVID-19 proven PCR positive patient. Whereas in this case, it looks exactly the same. Fair, fair enough, it's more extensive, but it's a condition which is rather rare. It's called alveolar proteinosis. So you'd have to put these in the context of the situation. So when we know that we are in a pandemic, it's unlikely that if we're seeing crazy paving, we're we're not going to be calling it alveolar proteinosis because on the one hand we know it is a very rare condition and knowing that the prevalence of a condition which has similar findings is actually more common then you're going to put that um obviously on your li top list of differentials and obviously then it will be um, proven with the pcr um test but other conditions that are actually common, and we see them quite often, are, for example, in the left-hand side, um, the right-hand right side image, which is um, organizing pneumonia. And it looks very similar to COVID-19 infection when we see the, the perilobular um, consolidation, as you can see in these areas. And these patients are treated very differently, as in we normally give these patients steroids um, rather than any other um, um, management options. And you don't want to be denying a patient that. So obviously, if you see this and the PCR is negative, then you are going to be thinking of alternative diagnoses. Isnophilic pneumonia is another one, as you can see, with that um, peripheral ground glass opacification. And in the setting of the pandemic, it's very easy to call that COVID-19 infection. 
But obviously you have to take that in the context of what are the blood results. And if you've got a very high eosinophilic count, then it's unlikely that it's going to be COVID-19 infection, particularly if PCR is negative. For I know they could still have PCR positive um, and have other conditions going on at the same time. So it's really important to take everything into consideration. So with, um, yeah, with eosinophilic pneumonia, your, your um, and synophilic count is really going to be high, so it's going to be very different in that case. So we can see if we can move on to the next slide now. Dr. Nicola, we can't see your arrow though. Just oh, could you not? Okay, so I'd have to draw it then. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then, with regards to severity, I'll show you in the next um, image how fast the disease can progress. Now, the images I am depicting are all from the Kent variant, and it was actually quite interesting to see that we had more patients. So, from my experience of um, reporting um, via teleradiology for the UK, based in with me based in Australia. We were seeing a lot of the Kent cases being hospitalized, and many of these patients were rapidly progressing to very severe disease, um, needing um, ventilation and care within the intensive care units. And the age groups were becoming even younger. So I'll be showing you some examples of patients as young as a 19-year-old um, needing ventilation and, and intubation. So the disease was having a slow start, but then the minute it hits severity, it quickly progresses to a very nasty acute lung injury. So the BSTI came up with a scoring system, which was actually broadly categorized into really just mild, moderate, and severe. And we found that um, as reporting radiologists, actually quite helpful in putting together a reporting temp, um, a reporting um, template because we were using a template and I'll talk about the templates um, later to try and help um, categorize the severity of condition which was aiding the clinicians to triage and see who might need escalation of treatment or not and it was very much related to the number at the start it was very much related to the number of areas of opacification that we were seeing but as i mentioned earlier it was it was very far in between that we saw less than three areas um, of ground glass opacification more often than not by the time they present to the hospital and are needing the ct scan there were far more than than three so i don't think i've reported a single case where i categorized the extent of disease as mild they were all at least moderate if not severe by the time we got um, to scan them and this is the so the next slide um, we will show um, an idea of the progression of disease can we move on to the next slide please Yes, perfect. So as you can see in the first left hand um, sorry right hand corner um, image, so I'll get the arrow here. So in this particular case, so with the first case, as you can see, that was day one of um, presenting to the hospital with symptoms of cough and shortness of breath. And the initial chest X-ray was completely normal. So as mentioned earlier, you can have a normal chest X-ray for at least up to six days of having had the infection. But then disease really quite starts evolving and it, take, it took about nine days to get to a stage of, in this case would be at least moderate to severe because you have bilateral involvement you have mid and lower zones and you've got um sorry both sides being involved here so you can see these areas of um, ground glass opacification in both lungs in the peripheral as you can see the center is still very loosened so you can see that there's sparing of the central parts of the lung we don't have any pleural effusions. As you can see, the angles are nice and crisp. So that really eliminates any other causes such as heart failure. Heart failure, as we said as well, it will be more central and wouldn't be peripheral. So see the difference. It was only, it was nine days to get to this stage um, of severity, but it only took three days for this patient to further develop areas of 
consolidation in addition to the ground glass. And as you can see from the tubes and lines of this patient, now they are in the ICU and they're intubated. So the rapidity of um, severity um, of the disease is really quite fast. And when we got to the stage of of describing the extent, then clinicians could really make a decision um, based on the image findings on the escalation of care that was needed at that stage. We can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So let's talk about the complications now. So as time um, was evolving, um, we could see that um, several complications were developing. Uh, we can move on to the next uh, slide, please. Thank you. So these are a few of the complications. There are several others, but the commonest by far was um, pulmonary embolism. And in fact, based on the fact that we were seeing quite a lot of pulmonary embolism, this has been covered uh, in a hematology um, webinar um, um, that has been discussed earlier in this series of webinars. Um, but from our context of imaging, we had to change our imaging protocols um, such that the timing of the contrast given to patients had to be targeting the pulmonary trunk rather than the conventional CT chest where it is actually scanned in a slightly later phase, which is an arterial phase where the pulmonary trunk is not depicted as well. So most patients who were coming in as query COVID or looking for signs of COVID, we were automatically doing them as CT pulmonary angiograms to look at the pulmonary trunk and make sure that we're not um, missing a pulmonary embolism, even just at presentation. Um, adult respiratory distress syndrome is something that was developing pretty fast when patient severity um, escalated and they were needing to go into ICU for ventilation. Um, and that is really when we started seeing a very extensive involvement with consolidation. And bacterial infection as a secondary, so many of these patients became um, uh, very unwell and they were hospitalized. The hospital is already a place um, which is very prone for hospital acquired pneumonias. Um, and these patients were um, very susceptible to developing um, secondary bacterial infection. We were also seeing um, several cases where um, patients would develop spontaneous pneumothoraces or even just pneumomediastinum in its own right without a pneumothorax and with no signs or any history of trauma or any other cause um, for those air leaks to happen. So I'll show you a few examples um, of these in the next slide, please. So as you can see in the left-hand side, so I've done my own annotations because I was not so sure if we'd have the um, opportunity for annotations during this, the session. So in the, in the far left um, image, you can see areas of secondary um, areas of consolidation. And this was the 19-year-old um, patient that I was very sad to see on my screens on one of my reporting days. And as you can see from, I'll use in um, annotation at this stage, because you can see that this patient is intubated there um, inside, they're in ICU. And the, you can see that there are areas of um, ground glass opacification and um, on both sides. The left lung is not as involved as the right lung, but this area of consolidation here is certainly very different um, to the rest of the extent of disease. And this is a patient who, um, despite um, support, was needing um, um, more um, oxygen requirements and then started getting really unwell. And he did end up having a secondary bacterial infection on top of um, his viral illness. On this image, um, it might actually be quite difficult to see because the windowing is done such that I'm hoping you can see part of the pulmonary arteries here on both sides. So it's only a slice. It's always difficult if you can't see it in, in volume, I understand. But if you try and imagine, you can see a dark um, shadow there in an area where it's meant to be bright white. You can see large pulmonary emboli there occluding um, the main pulmonary arteries. And you can see the areas of ground glass opacification on both sides in this um, COVID positive patient. 
And then in the um, far right image, you can see that there is, an, in addition to the ground glass opacification that you can see in the background, there are these areas of kind of more fluffy um, opacification with tree and bud. And that again was another example of um, superimposed in, um, bacterial infection on top of um, viral pneumonias. I don't have examples of the pneumomedicinum, I must admit, but we were seeing, it wasn't that common, but we were seeing um, quite a few um, of those cases as well. Can move on to the next slide, please. So we can now move on to um, the complications um, chronically um, rather than in the acute setting. So, sorry, I can't remove that arrow there, but we'll move on to the next slide. So the comments that we were starting to see is this um, fibrotic change in the underlying lung. So most acute infections don't normally tend um, to cause long-term damage in the lung. You know, I'm sure quite a few of us out here have had some form of bacterial infection at some point in our life in the chest. And whether it was viral, we didn't need to take antibiotics, but if it was bacteria, we took antibiotics, had the course, and we're back to our normal self. But the very sad thing that COVID is doing, and it is something that we did actually see in with similar previous infections with SARS, for example, is that there's a fibrotic element that is affecting about 20% of patients who do get um, COVID-19 infection. And this is an example of a patient um, um, I had um, in my reporting um, list where on the, the first day of his scan, so I'm saying day N plus zero, because it wasn't quite um, the first day of his infection, um, but it, this was you know back on, on that day of the 2nd of December last year, you can see the peripheral ground glass opacification like you would see in classic COVID-19 infection. But only 14 days later, um, you start seeing these areas of traction bronchiectasis and the um, honeycombing that's developing, you know, the septal lines um, um, peripherally, in addition to in areas where there were the ground glass changes on the previous scan. And this is only 14 days apart. We very much commonly see fibrotic changes from other causes developing over a period of years, not within days. Um, so this is the worrying thing about these patients, you know, and especially with particularly the Kent and also now with the um, Delta variant, we are seeing a large number of patients who are in the young category. So for these patients to end up with long-term um, lung conditions is actually going to be quite a big impact um, on the healthcare system with regards to follow up um, long-term of these patients and the debilitation um, following um, uh, the, the, this condition now. So we'll move on to the next slide, thank you. So moving forward, um, these are the things that we have to start taking into consideration. So um, we now are in a stage where elective imaging has obviously come back. So it had come back mid-end last year, but then had to stop again when um, Delta variant came in, into force. And there's this huge backlog. And only now um, are we start seeing the impact of this backlog, which um, already in a very strained um, resource of radiology reporting, um, particularly I can vouch that for the UK, I'm sure it's not too dissimilar across the rest of the world, and it would be nice to hear what um, one of our panelists from India will have to say on that, um, is that it's really going to become a really big problem to cope with the backlog. And obviously, these patients who have been um, denied um, this follow-up, and obviously, they have their conditions which we need to treat to. Um, this debilitation of the chronic complications of COVID-19 infection and putting in resources in place to following them up long-term, both from an imaging perspective, but also from the clinical perspective with rehabilitation and the specialist clinic follow-up. We have to see how we're going to use our templates. So we have been given by the societies, both the American and the British societies, templates for reporting. I did very much, since I was reporting for the UK um, market, we were using the British templates and it was very useful in the British situation to have a standardized approach 
to the way we were reporting these findings for the clinicians to have a clear idea on what the next step would be from a management perspective. We could also see this trajectory long term with regards to research potential for this and all our reports were being coded in our radiology imaging um, system. So we'd give a coding depending on severity so that for future um, research or even just as we're going, there's so much research going on as we speak. We could use these codes um, to bring up the images um, for reference. And throughout the UK and also internationally, um, there are these large imaging repositories for clinicians to refer to. And um, this is something that is all new to us. We're, we're learning as we go. And it's really important for us to learn from each other and share our resources. Um, you know, things like these webinars in particular, but particularly in the imaging perspective, it's really important for us to utilize these resources from these databases and contribute as well towards these databases um, for future learning. So we can move on to the next slide, thanks. So this is the example of the reporting template on the left-hand side. So you can see um, that um, it is uh, very clearly defined with regards to normal findings um, and then with regards to um, classic findings. And it gives you a really nice description of what we are expecting as radiologists to see under the classic heading. And then if anything doesn't quite fit in with that, could it be indeterminate and it could be any other cause or maybe still COVID in evolution? And then consider other findings that are not typical of what you'd expect of COVID-19 infection and it makes you start considering alternative diagnoses. And these are the codes I was referring to. So we'd put that at the bottom of all our reports. So I'd put in, you know, with this classic COVID-19 infection, I'd put in um, CV. CC um, for classic findings. And there were similar codings for the chest radiographs. So it was a very similar um, scoring system that we would use for in our databases. This is another image um, repository that the um, BSDI um, was collating and most of the British hospitals were contributing um, to, to this database where there are hundreds and hundreds of images um, that we can look through um, for our learning um, purposes. So we can move on to the next slide. And I think really this brings me to the um, close um, of my presentation today. I really would like to um, acknowledge um, all the patients um, who have gone through this and past, present and future, because we are still in the pandemic. It's it's very much reached us here um, in the summer, their hemisphere. It's a very much a reality among us now. And we need to be together to support each other um, through this. But I really want to acknowledge um, the consent of these patients in the teaching hospitals who without um, the resource of their images to learn from, um, we wouldn't be um, talking here today and learning from each other's experiences and, and teaching um, ourselves for the future. And thanks everyone um, for listening to me today. We can move on to the final slide. And greetings from New Zealand. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Nicola. Um, that was quite an educational webinar, and I'm sure all the attendees who attended it today would have found it quite informative and educational. So um, now I would like to encourage all the attendees to submit their questions using the Q&A button at the uh, bottom of your Zoom screen. And I would now like to invite our panelists, Dr. Raju and Dr. Thiru, to share their experiences and perspectives and also answer the questions from our attendees. And I will hand it back to you, Dr. Nicola, to mediate the panel discussion and the questions. Okay. Trying to see, I can't see any questions yet. Uh, I might just ask um, uh, Dr. Thiru and Dr. Raju to perhaps uh, tell us about their experiences uh, in India uh, while we are waiting for the questions to come up. I'll, I'll take that question. Uh, uh, hi everyone, my name is Raju Kalidindi. I'm a radiologist based in Hyderabad in India. And that was a great talk, uh, uh, Nikki, thanks for that. And uh, essentially the 
what I found is that the use of imaging in COVID has varied uh, extensively across the globe it, and depended primarily on the prevalence of disease at a particular time in a country and also the resources in that country. And when we uh, looked at our experience in India, during the times when there was no major surge in cases, uh, imaging was used as it should be uh, in cases where the diagnosis is in doubt, where we thought the RT-PCR was potentially false negative, uh, and also to uh, kind of uh, grade the disease to triage uh, ICU beds and you know, uh, things like that, which is the appropriate way to do it, and it fits in within the guidelines. But the moment the cases uh, start going up, for example, in the second wave, everything starts getting overwhelmed. So first thing that will go uh, uh, out of supply is RT-PCR capacity. And then we got to a stage where it took several days for the RT-PCR results to come back. So, and then CT by default uh, has become the, the primary diagnostic modality for COVID. It had some benefits in that you know, patients who were waiting for RT-PCR uh, were able to get some kind of diagnostic uh, answers from CT and they were able to uh, get some treatment. But there were also quite a few risks that came with it. Uh, and the first and foremost is that a normal CT was interpreted uh, not by radiologists, but some a lot of patients, some clinicians as negative for COVID. Uh, and that resulted in these patients not quarantining themselves and potentially going around and infecting others. So that, that's something that we learned. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we kind of had a discussion internally to make sure the language in the report clearly identifies that a, a negative CT just does not rule out COVID and it just means that the lungs were not infected at that particular time in the course of the disease. Uh, so that's something we learned. And second thing is, is the grading of the disease. Um, so they, in India, there is, uh, for uh, whatever the reason was, uh, the CORAD scoring, which was a, a Dutch uh, uh, scoring system that was developed back in March 2020, uh, when the pandemic was still beginning, uh, was quite extensively used in India, even during the peak of the pandemic. And that, that resulted in quite a few issues uh, because the scoring was supposed to be a diagnostic predictive score. Uh, instead, it was used as a severity score and, and, and patients were triaged based on that. So I think the, the lessons that we learned are that uh, it's quite important to have a nationwide consensus within the radiology community in countries like Australia, for example, that have not yet seen that major, uh, hopefully it never will, but it, if it does, it, it, uh, it helps to have an understanding amongst the radiology community and also amongst the pulmonologists and respiratory physicians the, as to what to use CT for, how do we report and how those reports are interpreted both by doctors, the media and the public. So that's that's what we learn. Yeah, that's really that's really good actually, Roger, because and that's why I didn't cover on the CORAD um, in my session, because I, I really wanted you to bring out um, that experience of yours with CORADS, um, because with the BSDI scoring, it was it was actually quite helpful to keep it quite broad in those broad categories of, of mild and moderate and severe, and it seemed to work well. Um, so I don't know if Sudarshan actually is, is around um, to tell us about how the scoring worked in Scotland, in Dundee, whether that had um, uh, an impact, but I can't seem to see him yet. This, no, I'm here. Yeah, it's Okay. Yeah, the thing is, um, again, um, yeah, it's one of the many variables in COVID, right? Uh, what from our experience, what you know, it's it's nice to have some sort of scoring, but the thing is, what you're scoring based on radiology and what the patient's status is completely different. You know, sometimes it correlates, um, many times it doesn't. So if somebody who you think, you know, who's got mild severity on CT, whereas the, when you look at the patient, the patient's condition is really bad and vice versa. So um, actually, I think oh, basically we are still learning. Uh, <laughs> we are still learning lots of new things. And I think so. I think there's always um, 
one of the things to keep in mind is you know just keep an open mind and see learn new things but um I, you know i agree we use we use the bsti scoring as well but uh it's at least it helps you when you're reporting just and especially when you want when when you're flooded with lots of cases it helps you really um to just um come to a conclusion and sign it off um it's good in that way but when you look at it uh, from a um, clinical point of view it helps most cases but you know some cases you know it, it doesn't really you know there is a, quite a bit of variability between the severity based on ct and the patient's uh, clinical severity and mm -hmm. we don't know what other variables are there Indeed. So following on from this, I'm, I'm going to the questions now that um, our attendees have kindly um, posted. And I'm going to start, I'm not quite going into the order they're coming in. I'm just going to bring them in depending on our discussion. And based on what you and, and Raju have just said about the scoring in relation to the patient symptoms, there is one question here where it asks about um, how commonly are there abnormal findings on a CT done for other reasons. So for example, on the CT abdo and trauma, and are these patients often um, asymptomatic? Um, so I'll put it to both of you. I kind of can add my bit then after that, because we were actually then scanning, you know, particularly patients going to routine, you know, not, uh, you know, acute surgery for abdominal pathology, for example. We ended up finding our situation having to scan their chest anyway as a screening for the anesthetist to see. And obviously those patients were completely asymptomatic um, of COVID. But how did you do it in Scotland and in India um, for these patients who didn't really quite come in with any symptoms? Um, yeah, I'll take this. Actually, there's two bits to it. You know, the first half, maybe in, during the first half of the first wave, uh, we were asked to, actually, it's the Royal College of Surgeons. Um, they came up with a proposal that all patients who are going to theatre should have a CT chest uh, performed for the anesthetist and um, surgeon's benefit. Uh, we did this for some time, maybe a few months, and then uh, it wasn't really uh, productive. And then the guidelines were changed, and then they said it's no longer useful. Uh, but the thing is, now so actually, yeah, and in the second half, and at least during the second wave, what they um, um, what the hospital did was, um, so the emergency tra trauma, the emergency cases, they had identified a separate theater for, you know, we had um, um, amber, green, and a red pathway. So red pathway was for COVID pass positive patients. Amber was unknown, uh, like, you know, people who just turn off the street after accident or come with very perf. So they had a separate theater for them and uh, they had separate group of personal anesthetists, theater support staff and surgeons. Uh, and the elective surgeries, what, the, um, what they did was the, um, they asked the patients to isolate for 14 days at home and the hospital even supplied their groceries. And so they would have their test on their 10th day and uh, just and then um, a PCR test on the 10th day and then on the day of um, um, coming and uh, getting admitted to the hospital for surgery and they had a separate set of wards so it was completely different right from the hospital entrance to yeah. the wards and the theaters so that was during the second wave when we learned a few things Okay, um, so you didn't end up scanning those chests then? They just went no, no, for the no, surgery? No. Okay. Actually, the scanning the chest was maybe in the first, uh, maybe um, March, April, May 2020, and then it stopped. Okay, okay. Was that similar in India, Raju, or did you do things differently? Oh, I can't hear you. common mistake. Uh, sorry, we didn't specifically scan the chest when we didn't need to, but and obviously when we include the lung bases for abdominal scanning 
or even for MRI for spine, we did find quite a few patients who were asymptomatic from a lung perspective, uh, but still had COVID findings. So I think it again depends on where you are in, in your up and down curves. Uh, during the peak of a, uh, of a wave, uh, a lot of asymptomatic patients uh, that have any imaging of any kind will end up having chest findings. So, uh, yeah, so we, we did find quite a few asymptomatic patients with uh, chest findings. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And then, for example, so now leading on from that, there's a question which says, you know, if, if RT-PCR is negative, um, would imaging be recommended if patients have symptoms of what we think is COVID? What have you done with, with those patients? Yeah, I think the guidelines uh, say that if you got two RT-PCRs negative, then you go on and do, uh, do some kind of imaging. So chest X-ray in most cases, but CT in some cases is, uh, is supposed to be what the guidelines say. But I found that the threshold for CT, at least in India, was, was quite low. Uh, yeah. So even if the first RT-PCR was negative, the clinician is strongly suspecting COVID, they would get a CT straight away. Yeah, it is very sensitive and, and chest x-rays, like we all know, you know, miss out a lot on particularly knowing that this is a predominant ground glass um, presentation rather than consolidation, like some of the bacterial infections. It's very hard to see ground glass on a chest x-ray and very subtle changes will not be visible at all um, on a chest x-ray. Um, which is fair enough. So then a similar question from the same um, attendee, um, Manish, um, is there a way you can differentiate viral infections? I mean, I struggle. Um, I, I struggle to differentiate any inflammatory changes in, in the lung and, and I do lung <laughs> as my area. And, you know, and I always find that is a real challenge when put under the spotlight by clinicians to try and ask me, oh, Nikki, what do you think the diagnosis is? And I'm like, it's a black and white picture. All I can see are shades of gray. Um, and I can only base it on the symptoms you're trying to describe to me. Um, have you found it? Um, have you found a way of trying to differentiate um, these viral infections? You know, like, for example, so at the moment in New Zealand, um, I don't know if you're getting um, quite a prevalence of it in, in India or um, Scotland, but we're seeing a lot of RSV in our adult population. Now, RSV, to my knowledge, is very much a, a pediatric um, bronchiolitis and bronchitis, but we're seeing a lot of it. Um, in the adult um, population, and it's actually getting very close to what influenza would look like. But then it looks very different to COVID. And um, COVID is actually quite nice in its own right, is looking very different to most of the viral pneumonias I am accustomed with. But I don't know if you had a lot of overlap in India or in Scotland where it was actually quite difficult to distinguish one from the other. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take this actually. The thing is, um, I don't know whether it's due to the masking and the lockdowns. Actually, last winter, there wasn't much of influenza or any of these respiratory infections. It was mainly COVID. So whenever we see some inflammatory change, which looks like COVID, you say, no, that needs to be um, ruled out. Whereas um, we are in summer right now here, so, but this winter they're expecting lots of other respiratory infections to um, the, um, to increase because basically the immunity has worn out in people. So I think uh, we are behind the curve on this Nikki. So I think um, we'll see more this winter. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it sounds like, you know, from what I'm being told, we're in a similar situation in Australia where there wasn't much um, influenza because of the very strict hygiene um, that um, was going around. But yeah, for some reason, RSV has really picked up here in New, in New Zealand, which is very unexpected. Um, but we'll see. Now, there's a question coming up about the um, chronic complications. So there are two related to it with regards to one, do the patients who do develop um, fibrotic changes end up having a poorer outcome? I haven't seen, it's still quite early for me to see these patients yet and see what the overall outcome is, but I don't know if 
you guys are seeing that now at this stage in the UK and India. No, it, I agree. It's too early to, uh, uh, to, to make any conclusions on that. Uh, there is, as we all know, in a good number of patients, uh, ongoing symptomatology that goes on for months. Uh, that includes breathlessness, that includes uh, several other symptoms. So to what extent that is due to residual pulmonary fibrosis or whether it's just ongoing inflammation, it's, it's I think, too early to say. Yes, no, that's fair enough. And then following on, um, on that line of follow-up of chronic conditions is, um, should we be repeating these um, images for patients who are seen to have um, fibrotic changes? I mean, I know the BSDI now have given us some follow-up guidelines, but I understand it's very much guided by symptoms. But I don't know if you have now been seeing any requests being submitted for any follow-up imaging or whether you're following any guidelines in relation to that. Uh, not really, Nikki. I think it's still early days. Um, um, again, we haven't really seen a correlation between the lung changes and the clinical picture of, you know, if you hear about these long COVID cases, but uh, I don't think anybody has published anything regarding uh, findings on CT um, uh, with the clinical symptomatology. So I think it's still early days. Yeah, no. I, I totally agree because yeah, I mean, I'm still um, reporting for the UK with these volumes, and yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing those yet. But having said that, it's getting quite. We're in that double-edged sword situation where we are now into that backlog of elective follow-up imaging. So maybe we have quite a few of these patients who are stuck in that backlog, and we haven't quite seen them yet because they haven't had the opportunity to even get to the scanner because of these um, waiting lists. So there is a question um, specifically um, for the two of, um, for, for Raju, really, from in India. Um, and the question is um, regarding, you know, what kind of idea of volumes um, of cases have you been seeing during the second wave? It's difficult to put a number, I guess, isn't it, Raju? No, I can, I can say it for scanners. Scanners that were doing about 25 cases a day scan 120 to 130 a day. Yeah, so it's about five or six times the usual volume. As I said, a lot of that, or at least some of that could be due to inappropriate usage, but they had no choice. When, when there was no RT-PCR, CT became the default. But yes, the five to six times increase in volume of CTs is what we've seen. And this will be COVID related or including everything else now? Yeah, everything else has taken a backseat. There was very few patients coming in for, for uh, anything other than acute emergency. So 95% of those were all COVID scans. Oh, wow. Okay, yes. Were our scanners coping? Because I understand now in the UK situation, there was a calculation by the college that we don't even have enough scanners, let alone people to scan these people, you know, as in, you know, radiographers on site, they even click the buttons um, to catch up with the number. Um, so, you know, what are we going to do with the resource lag, um, which is a big issue now? Um, so there is a specific question asked to me about um, reporting in New Zealand, actually. So is there a consensus here? So in New Zealand, we very much um, base this on the College um, of um, Australia and New Zealand. It's a combined college for Australia and New Zealand um, of radiologists. And most of the consensus statements have been taken based on the American um, 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 framework. So I understand that if we were to go down that line, so we haven't seen, well, I'm right in the tip of the South Island. And um, so I haven't quite seen, um, well, we have seen a case coming through from a ship that was out in the port and only got as far as getting a chest x-ray, but we didn't see the, the CT. Um, but we, we don't have quite yet the consensus, but my understanding is that um, we will go down a line of a consensus statement um, based on possibly the Fleischner, but we'll need to see updates um, from, the, from the college and um, based on that to see if we will be disseminating um, this um, form of reporting. As you say, Raju, it can actually create more problems. So I'm trying to take a, 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 
a, a, a step back from going down the line of these unformalized reporting patterns until we are actually faced with a situation where we're going to rely on that form of reporting from a um, prognostication um, and triaging um, perspective. Um, so then there's another um, question um, for, uh, for the panels. And so if COVID symptoms and imaging was mainly around, um, I'm sure it's, it's the, uh, diffuse um, alveolar damage and vascular thrombosis, was there increased incidence of other vascular thrombosis or DVT? Um, oh, that's a hematologist question. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Divji can answer that one. Um, but I don't know if Raju and Sudarshan, you seem to want to answer that one. Yeah, I'll take that. Actually, there, uh, there is definitely increased incidence of thrombosis elsewhere in the body. Actually, uh, we've seen uh, strokes, um, um, uh, abdominal, uh, uh, you know, su superior mesenteric artery thrombosis, thrombosis everywhere, you know, wherever you, you can think of. So you really need to have an open mind. And if the patient is presenting uh, um, in a different sort of way, you just need to, and again, venous sinus thrombosis, we still get referrals for venous sinus thrombosis, again, from people who had COVID and people who had COVID vaccination. That's another yep. thing which is going on. Um, but actually, uh, there's uh, lots of things. And if you speak to the vascular surgeons um, regarding the clot, they say the, even the clot pattern is different. You know, people or the interventional radiologists who do thrombectomies, they say the clot is different compared to the usual clot they see from atherosclerosis. They say this is more sticky and a bit more... Rubbery. They say what they say is it doesn't come as come back as one solid clot. You have to really work hard to retrieve it, and it just. Well, that's uh, quite a risk then, because the procedure then could be um, unsatisfactory with residual yeah, exactly. clots. So it's very okay. sticky. They say you know it's difficult to take it out. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, I've seen um, uh, quite a few strokes in young patients, and then we see lots of. Abdominal ischemia, superior mesenteric artery thrombosis. Mm -hmm. Dipti, did you want to add anything to that? So Dipti is a hematologist and um, specialist. Um, no, not really. Um, I think um, the only other comment I'll make is if you do see uh, pulmonary uh, embolism, uh, I guess there's always the issue of where the clots are coming from. Um, but once you've got a clot in one place, it doesn't really matter where it's coming from. So we, uh, as clinicians, we tend not to try and chase that and get ultrasound Doppler for um, a leg clot, for example, uh, in, in that situation. I don't really have any other comments beyond that. So that's actually, you, you bring that up. So at the start of this, people were questioning that, you know, so the concept, the physiology behind pulmonary embolism, like you kind, you know, you alluded to is that it is embolic from another source. But I think as research was coming through, it seems that it is developing de novo and it's not actually embolic. So the thrombus is actually forming in the pulmonary trunks themselves. And there isn't actually a source that's shooting off these emboli, you know, unlike the situation. And I'm actually not surprised by what Sudeshan is saying, that the interventionists are realizing that the consistency of this clot is very different um, to clots that the interventionists are seeing with atherosclerotic disease. And that would kind of support the idea of this de novo formation um, of clot, which, which is interesting. So following from that then, um, now there's a question um, regarding the post-COVID um, fibrosis, which says, are there any acute CT findings um, in the acute stage um, that could give us an indication that these patients might progress or will progress to fibrotic um, post-COVID lung? I don't know about Sudeshan and Raju. I found it difficult, I must admit. The, the cases I've seen um, where I've seen fibrotic change, you know, particularly that example that I brought up um, with the fibrosis developing on day 14 um, from infection, there was no hint on the first scan and the background lungs. I had 
a previous scan of that patient from previous years where he was completely um, healthy and had a scan done for other reasons. And the scan was completely normal. You know, they weren't even smokers. There was no risk of any underlying um, lung pathology. But I don't know if you know of anything yourselves. I don't think there's enough literature out there yet to tell us if we can predict, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I agree, Nikki. I don't think there's um, anything definite, you know, from my own experience, uh, maybe there is an association with volume of disease, um, but, uh, but that's my own mm. experience, but uh, I don't think there's anything definite. Yeah, volume of disease, because I was thinking that as well, when I was seeing really severe cases, and then they get their follow up, and it just disappears, you know, because when I see severe cases, I'd say, oh, these are bound to get fibrotic change, you know, they're so bad, they've gone all the way to ICU, intubated, all that, and then, you know, two weeks down the line, their lungs are back to normal and then somebody who didn't even quite get to that extent of severity developed such fibrotic lungs um, so you could see that image I brought up that patient never ended up having really severe condition he just had the ground glass changes that you see in your moderate extent never quite went down the line of consolidation in addition to all that so I found it difficult so Raju I don't know if you had any different experiences to that no, I did not. And I think it's, uh, I, I, I don't think it's clear who's going to get fibrosis and why. So I think we, we just want to wait and see. Uh, yeah, and I don't even know if it is variant related. So I was very much seeing it with a Kent. I haven't seen enough of the Delta variant yet. And I think, as I kind of seem to suggest at the start, I don't think many of the Delta variants are, not as many are being hospitalized as we saw with Kent. So I, I clearly had larger numbers with the Kent, you have a lot of Delta in, in India, of course, and you're probably seeing a lot of the Delta variant, but I don't know if you've seen any difference in the fibrotic complications with Delta various, the Kent variant. We haven't seen any, any difference in the pulmonary manifestations at all between the two, uh, at least on the acute side, chronic side, we'll have to wait and see. It's still too early for that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bob. This has been a really interesting um, discussion. I don't know if there's anything. We don't have any more questions in the Q&A, but I don't know if there's anything else people want to add um, from the organizers as well. Yeah, what I would say is if you're running an organization, uh, you just need to be flexible. You know, these uh, COVID cases go up and down numbers. So you just need to be flexible so that you can open up capacity as the cases rise and um, uh, maybe reduce your COVID capacity and open up the other normal capacity as cases yeah. go down. And we don't know when it's going to come back. And, you know, we're just keeping our fingers crossed for when the temperatures go down. So I think you just need to be flexible and, um, and um, be as nimble as possible. Yes, well, ho hopefully we won't be seeing those numbers here in, in the Southern Hemisphere, but it's a wait and, wait and see, I guess, isn't it? I agree. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, I cannot see any more questions coming in. There's a thank you from one of the attendees, and I am sure that all our live attendees, as well as those who will be watching the recording post the webinar, will find this talk in the panel discussion quite educational and informative. So also thanks to the wonderful audience for joining in today and Dr. Nikola for presenting and Dr. Raju and Dr. Sudarshan for the excellent panel discussion. I will quickly wrap up this presentation and would also request the panelists and the speaker to stay in the Zoom webinar um, until the end. It won't be long. Okay. So there's a thank you. Uh, a quick note on the next webinar, which will be delivered by Dr. Satish, who will be talking about pediatric COVID and multi-system hyperinflammatory syndrome, MISC-C in children. And this will be held on 25th August, uh, same time. So please go and register onto the website if you're interested. Now I would launch a poll for the audience to rate the webinar. 
uh, because we really value your feedback. Um, and if you'd like to provide any more subjective feedback, you can always email us and I'll share the email address towards the end. And a final note on the ANU COVID-19 peer support program. If you are a medical or healthcare professional, you can register to volunteer using this website and there's a form up there. Or if you'd like to seek support, you can also visit this link and fill in another form to contact us. You can also email us on international.health at anu.edu.au or WhatsApp us on the following number. And that's it for today. So I'll quickly, okay, so we've got uh, some great response for the rating of the webinar. Um, if Dr. Raju, Dr. Thiru and Dr. Nicola are happy uh, for us to take a quick picture for our social media, I'll take a click on three, two, one. Yeah, that's fine. So Dr. Nicola, can you say something just so that the box is on you because you're our highlight speaker? What do you want me to do? Sorry. Yeah. Just give me a smile. Okay, one more. If you just say hello or something, just so we have the highlight box on you. Hello. Hello. Perfect. That worked. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. Really Thank appreciate you your joining. Support. Really, Thank really you. enjoyed that. Thank you. All right.